are. At our summit, we are going to have line dancing, which is going to be cool. Good morning. Okay, I'm going to try to manage holding these different things in a clicker. So bear with me, y'all. My name is Terry Emond, and I am the president and CEO of the Lupus Foundation of America, Georgia chapter. And I want to welcome you all here today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a great day to have a great day, right? So the Lupus Foundation, we are here to support the patient journey. And that is a journey from the time that you are aware of your symptoms, you go to the doctor, you get diagnosed, you get into a protocol of care, you get into a point of advocacy, of self-advocacy, self-management, and being able to perhaps support other people who are living with lupus. And that's part of the journey. But we're here to live, learn, and thrive, and to do it together. The together part is the most important. We are a community, the lupus community, that is here to support each other. And we at the foundation are here to help. So I have some staff members here that I would like to acknowledge for the work that they're doing. Consuelo Farley is in the back there. Consuelo is here. We have, she is our event manager. We have Alondra Zapata, who is our um, patient navigator, and Adrian Allende, who is our bookkeeper and keeps us in line. So I'm grateful for our presenters, for our um, staff, our volunteers, and we also have a board member, Vivi Wen. Our board chair is here as well today. But I want to thank you all for coming here. You're the reason. You got up today and came down here to this program. So you took that first step towards improving your knowledge of what we are doing here at the Lupus Foundation. So what do we provide at the foundation? We have education programs, teleconferences, symposiums, an annual Lupus Empowerment Summit, which is going to be held October the 7th at St. Anne's Catholic Church in Marietta. Beautiful facility. It's going to be tables, rounds, and we're going to serve breakfast and lunch. And we're, like I said before, we're having line dancing. It's just going to be a day of camaraderie, of fellowship, of learning more about lupus, and learning how to live with lupus and live well with lupus. What kind of resources do we have? We have emergency financial assistance, patient inquiries. We have bilingual support and resources physician referrals, clinical trials information, and then we, we supply information about local clinics and, and government resources. There's also the Lupus Resource Center, and that is uh, just a, 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 a site that has so much information about lupus. All of this is available at our website at lupusga.org, and you all have my cards in your folders, and it's got our website on there. Everything we do is mentioned in that. So we can not talk about advocacy. We have Chris Reed here today, who's the head of our advocacy committee. And we have, we have Quinn Cousin, who was down there with us from Arenia Pharmaceutical. We go down to the Capitol and we turn it purple for a day. We let these legislators know that lupus matters. We go down there and they proudly put on their capes. It's gotten to the point where they ask us when our lupus advocacy day is going to come. When can I wear my cape? But if you look here, it's just an amazing amount of support. And the woman at the center of that is Re Representative Kim Schofield, who is living with lupus and who champions our cause 365 days a year. And we're grateful for what she does. Last but not least, we have to mention our support groups across the, the state of Georgia. Support group leaders are the boots on the ground. They are the ones who are providing information day in, day out to people living with lupus, providing peer-to-peer -peer support. You see me sitting up here in this, in this scooter. I don't have lupus. I have muscular dystrophy. It does something different to my body. I empathize, I understand, and I'm knowledgeable about lupus. But when I talk to somebody with lupus, we talk and we share our common common themes of what goes on. When two people living with lupus talk to each other, they're talking the same language. It's just amazing to see that transformation. When somebody with lupus says, I'm tired, to another person with lupus, they say, I know exactly what you mean. They get it. Am I right? They get it. 
It's hard to get. It's not always easy to get. So let's talk about some of our upcoming programs and events. We have two more walks this year. We already had a walk in Atlanta and one in, in Augusta. But in May, on September the 16th, we're going to Central City Park in Macon for a walk. And then we're going to the Woodruff Riverfront Park on September 23rd in Columbus. These are just great opportunities to go into Macon and Columbus and show those communities that lupus matters, that we're important. This is a celebration of lupus awareness. And that's what that's our goal has to be. You know, when I say somebody says, I know exactly what you mean. Our goal is that when you walk up to anybody, anybody in the state of Georgia and say, I have lupus, they will say, I know exactly what lupus is. That's one of our goals is to really spread awareness. So we talk about our empowerment summit. It's on October the 7th from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. It's just a day of empowerment. It's a day that is about you meeting your needs, getting you to meet other people living with lupus, just sharing ideas. And at the end of the day, we have a segment called Putting the Pieces Together. We want you to come to these programs and learn about lupus and learn about ways to cope with lupus and to live well with lupus. And at the end of the day, we don't want you to take that knowledge and go home and put it in a drawer. We want to learn how you can incorporate that into your life. So what we do is we charge everybody with telling us one way they're going to take something they learned that day and make a change for the positive in their life. And it's amazing the, the stories that we get and the, and the feedback that we get. So if you haven't registered for that, there's a little um, postcard in your folder, and that's got a QR code, and that you, know, you can register right now if you want. Then we have a gala coming up, and that is Friday, November 3rd. This is an elegant evening. The tickets are $250 each, and this raises funds for the Lupus Foundation. Our mission call that night, which is gains the most amount of money, that goes towards our emergency financial assistance. That emergency and financial assistance is meant for people who are going to have their lights turned off or can't pay their rent. And we want people to be able to pay their rent and to turn the lights on and to get their medications and be able to go to the doctor. So that what, that's what that fund is about. And this is what we're raising funds for that night. So we're here all today to help us solve this cruel mystery of lupus. And it is cruel and it is a mystery, but together we can work towards a better future for people living with lupus. So my first speaker, this is where I've got to juggle things guys, so I can read. Our first speaker today is Dr. Wambai Mashwa. She is actually helped us put this whole program together. Come on up here while I introduce you. This amazing woman came to me and said, let's do a program at Piedmont. And this is our first venture back into live programs since the pandemic. The last live program that we did in Atlanta was here at Piedmont, and that was March of 2020. And that was right before the world shut down. So we're glad to see you out here. We're glad, glad to see people here. So Dr. Mashwa has been a community rheumatologist at Piedmont Physicians Atlanta for the last eight years. She's a director of rheumatology clinical research and has been a primary investigator in multiple clinical trials, primarily lupus. She's involved in the American College of Rheumatology, the CDC collaborative work group to develop patient reported outcome measures to enhance lupus and care, and is on the ACR work group developing an ACR quality measurements for health equity white paper. Dr. Mashua believes medicine brings healing through partnership between the patient and the medical provider team. Amen to that. That is huge. That's one of our topics at our summit is managing the doctor patient relationship. She's a strong advocate for her patients and is proactively involved in research, work, and work to reduce healthcare disparities and inequities in lupus care. Dr. Mashua me mentored four residents who are now rheumatologists and was awarded a medical student preceptorship award in the summer of 2022 and was selected a Piedmont Outstanding Woman during Women's History Month in March 2023. 
Congratulations. Congratulations. She's past chair of the Georgia Society of Rheumatology, a member of the American College of Rheumatology, Georgia Society of Rheumatology, Medical Association of Georgia, and serves as a lead physician on the Lupus Foundation of America Medical, Medical Advisory Board. We're so grateful for her leadership in that capacity as she keeps our doctors engaged because that's important for doctors and patients, foundation for all of us to work together. She completed her fellowship training in rheumatology at Augusta University Medical Center in Georgia, medical degree from American University of Integrative Sciences University of, I'm going to say that wrong, Sin Eustatius. Sin Eustatius School of Medicine, Dutch Caribbean. She completed her residency in internal medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. Her undergraduate degree in microbiology and molecular genetics is from Oklahoma State University. In her free time, she enjoys her family, cooking, and friends. Now, I want to tell you my personal connection here. I met Dr. Mashua when we did a program over at Augusta. Augusta University years ago. I think it was like 2010 or 11 or... No, no, no. Don't make me that old. 20, I think 2014. <laughs> 14. Okay. Okay. Don't make me that old. 2014. And she got up and she did a program about the wisdom of her elders. And she just presented slides. And one of them was, if you want to, they, they were all brilliant. I've been printed out. If you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, run together. And that's what we're doing. We want, this is a marathon. We want to run far. We want to do this and we are all in this together. And we need you. You need us. We need the doctors. We need researchers. We need our government agencies. This is a collaborative effort to get us to the finish line. So thank you so much. And without further ado, and without me going on and on, I would like to introduce Dr. Mashwa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much. I appreciate that kind introduction. And yes, I'm very excited that today's here and you made it happen, your team and everybody here today. Um, it's going to be a great day. So I'll just do um, an overview on lupus. Um, the, the doctor who is going to go into the meat of the re reason we're here is Dr. Tumlin. So this is a very basic overview. All right. This is a picture I got from the internet but it de describes why we call lupus lupus. Lupus is Latin for wolf. And a 13th century physician, Rogerius, described, um, used the word to describe the erosive uh, facial re lesions reminiscent of a wolf's bite. And that's how the name lupus came about. The particular complication of lupus that presents like this is discoid lupus. So we can see lupus is an old disease, 13th century. And uh, as a summary, lupus is a chronic inflammatory disease that occurs when the body's immune system attacks self tissues and organs. What is inflammation? Inflammation is a good process. So inflammation in the body helps us fight infections, helps with wound healing. But in lupus, this process is dysfunctional and causes that immune system to cause damage to tissues. It, the inflammation can occur in different organs. The most common are joints, when you have arthritis and your joints hurt and they swell and you're stiff, skin, uh, kidneys, blood cells. I'm sure some the ones who are in the room who have Lupus, you've been told you have anemia or some other problems with the white, uh, blood cell counts. The heart, lungs, and brain, though rare, but that, uh, that's also an organ that can be affected. Who gets lupus? Often affects women of childbearing age, but also affects men. Um, the Ethnic groups that are most commonly affected are African American, Hispanic, or Latino Asians, Native Americans, and those groups are two to three times more likely 
affected than Caucasian women or men, but it can affect anybody. It also, as far as the age groups can affect children, including teens, uh, like I mentioned men and elderly people can get lupus even though less common. And what causes lupus? And like I said, this is a very general overview of lupus because today we're here for lupus nephritis, but what causes lupus? This is a topic for maybe a whole day or a week or many months. We're still trying to figure out. There's a lot of research and understanding that's going into this, but it's a combination of things. It's a dysfunction in genes that we know for sure um, that causes immune regulation Immune regulation is what drives inflammation. And then environmental factors. The one I'm going to point out to since we're in the beautiful summer season is UV light, All right? So it's a combination of factors that drive the disease, but we still cannot pinpoint. It's not one factor, but it's multi, multiple factors. And then I'm gonna just touch on these kidney lupus. It, uh, kidney lupus affects up to 60% of adults and 80% of children may develop kidney uh, lupus later. 25 to 50% of patients with lupus have abnormalities of urine or kidney dysfunction early on in the disease, meaning there are patients whose first diagnosis is kidney lupus. And then up to 60% of patients living with lupus can develop lupus during the course of their life living with lupus. The official term that we use to describe kidney lupus is lupus nephritis. Uh, you will also see something called proliferative lupus nephritis. I'm going to leave that to Dr. Tumley. <laughs> and again, inflammation is what's driving the disease in the kidneys. So there's inflammation involving the kidney tissues and that causes injury and dysfunction in the kidney. Kidney lupus is actually the most common severe complication of lupus. And that's why we're here today because we need to shine the light on that complication. Lupus in itself, systemic lupus is a bad disease. And when you get kidney lupus, it's, it can become a very complicated um, process leading to damage to the kidneys, patients ending up uh, on dialysis and even dying. So that's why we're here today. It can be uh, organ threatening. And when you see organ threatening, sometimes uh, in your notes, in your doctor's notes, this means it can be severe, rapid. So the process can become within months, you can go from potentially looking like you have healthy kidneys to kidneys that shut down and don't work. Uh, it can be progressive, and when you have damage that's uncontrolled, it can cause irreversible damage in the kidney tissues. Our mission, as far as kidney lupus care, number one, we're here to raise, and we're going to continue, not just today. Today is kind of the beginning of getting everybody together, raise awareness about the severity of kidney lupus, the need to diagnose and treat early. I want us, each one of us to tap into our power to become actively engaged in our lupus care. I say that in all my presentations, as a lupus patient, you should be your best, your own best advocate along with your loved ones, your family members. Um, so attend seminars like this, listen online, um, go to your doctor with questions, and that becomes a very, successful treatment um, team, you and your uh, providers. And last, better understand the disease, seek good resources to manage the disease, and, be, and we should all become advocates for resources to overcome barriers, reduce disparities and in health inequity in healthcare, especially in lupus nephritis care. We know for sure that different patients living with lupus are receiving different kinds of care, that's another topic for a whole day, week, months, years. So we want each person to be able to receive as much as possible equal care, which leads to um, good outcomes. And I'm going to start closing with this um, great Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King. 
said, and I have to make a correction, it says healthcare, it's actually health. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. I totally agree with Martin Luther King who was way ahead of his time. And this, if you read the whole thing, he, he started off with segregation because resources were going into segregation. And that's why he said the most uh, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking. Um, because if you are not healthy, it, is re it really takes away opportunities. It takes away from anything else you can do with your life. This was profound, again, from a, a profound insight from a man well ahead of his times. And although we have made great progress in medical discoveries, great inequalities exist in clinical care and in research. So again, we should all be involved. We can do this together, one team one fight against lupus. And um, thank you very much. And as Terry said, I always have this slide there. If we wanna go fast, one of these proverbs, these are proverbs, African proverbs, they're, they're wise sayings. If we want to go fast, uh, you go alone, but if you wanna go far, we go together. Thank you so much. Here we go. We're going to switch over to Dr. Tumlin's slides here. So our next speaker, Dr. Mashwood, thank you so much. Thank you for all that you do for um, our community. We really appreciate you. So we have Dr. Tumlin here, Dr. James Tumlin. And I don't have your bio, so I'm reading this off the website. So you feel free to add to it after I talk embellish it, okay? Because we, I want you to know how much we appreciate you. Okay, so Dr. Tomlin is a provider with Georgia Nephrology, who specializes in nephrology. He earned his medical degree from the University of South Florida. Dr. Tomlin is a board-certified nephrologist, internal medicine, and completed his fellowship at Emory University. And I had the privilege of meeting you years ago at a program that you did at Emory, and I think it might have been during clinical trials. Yeah. I think it was in the clinical trial stage. I've been doing it a long time. And I came to that program with Chris Reed, who is in the audience, and he is um, one of the speakers on our panel today with you. Right. Okay. So I'm going to, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. James Tumlin, who's going to talk to us a little bit about lupus nephritis. Well, thank you very much. I think I got this right. Thank, thank you. Exactly. All right. Can everybody hear me? Well, thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning. So I'm Jim Tumlin. So uh, many of you know me from my time at Emory. I'm still a professor of medicine there, but uh, I'm now running a large clinical trials research operation with Georgia Nephrology on the Northeast side of the city. And as uh, she just intimated, we've been doing clinical trials in lupus and various other diseases for a long, long time. And let me just give the audience a word. I, the, um, Suddenly, the pharmacologic community has sort of woken up to this disease, and there have been some major understandings that have come about uh, in the last five to ten years, and one in particular for the African American community, which I'm going to highlight uh, in my talk. So I was thinking to myself, well, you know, what, what would the audience like to know from a nephrologist if you've got lupus? And so Dr. Mashnow did a really nice summary of the, uh, the background of this. And just to reemphasize what she said, uh, I think this is really important. The best lupus patients that I have are the ones that are actively engaged. And if you ever have a physician who doesn't want to answer your questions or, or gets annoyed answering your questions, that's not the guy or the woman you want to have. You want to have a person that's really actively engaged. So lupus nephritis is seen in about 60% clinically of the patients. And I'm going to go over that in just a minute about what that clinical manifestation looks like. But if I did a biopsy of everybody in the room that has lupus, better than 95% of them will have evidence in the kidney that there's actual lupus deposition of autoantibodies in the kidney. Now that drops out of question, right? Why do the, what's the difference between the 60% that have the immune complex and those that have the clinical disease? 
It's probably what's called the second hit hypothesis. There are three known genes that have been identified in mouse models of lupus, and all of them are involved with regulation of T cells autoimmunity. So we're, when we're in utero, uh, our T cells circulate in our body, and they, for lack of a better word, they catalog what is you and what is not you. It's self from non-self. Through a process that's still being delineated, probably from mom and dad, a genetic background, and then a second hit, which is usually a viral illness of some type, there's a breakdown of what's called self-tolerance. So now these T cells are going around circulating and suddenly they can't recognize what is your normal kidney from a bacteria, a fungus, a virus, or a cancer. And then the immune system does what the immune system is so elegantly designed to do, which is to attack and kill that which is not you. Does that make sense? And so at the core of this, what uh, groups that deal with lupus patients are trying to do is to keep a cap on that dysregulation. Can I make you back to where you were in utero? Obviously not. And so what happens when this disease is set into motion, it's really a measure of uh, controlling it. And what you don't want to do is, as Matthew sort of alluded to, you really don't want to let it get in your kidneys. And can I say a couple things that's a little bit frightening? And I, I do this to my own patients. If, if you're a young person, and you lose your kidneys from lupus or any disease, you literally cut your life expectancy in half. It's true. It's a big, big deal. And it is an absolute anathema for me to round in my dialysis view and see a young woman on dialysis from lupus. I can't stand it. It just drives me crazy. And if you pay attention, and sometimes you have to treat people more aggressively to get them in this room. I'm going to make a real point, important point. What is true remission? What is going to keep me out of trouble? And what is basically what I refer to as Band-Aid medicine? So let me, I'm kind of preaching now. So let's kind of move forward here. So, <laughs> oh, you don't want me doing that. Okay, so I'm going to review about the difference between routine lists of lupus and what you guys know. And, and maybe the things you kind of knew but need to be reminded of about the symptoms that are more attuned to lupus nephritis. I'm going to review about how the kidney works so that you understand why this goes wrong and why it manifests itself the way it does. I'm going to go into some detail about the different classes of lupus nephritis. And you don't need to know all of them. You really need to know three, which we'll go over. I'm going to talk about some important racial differences between outcomes and what is some new information as to why that may be. This is uh, something I really want to emphasize. And then I'm, I'm going to review data on two of the most recent drugs that have come into uh, the uh, market for treatment of lupus surprise. There was a 35-year gap between the one drug <laughs> approved for lupus, which was Plaquenil. Did you know that prednisone was not approved for treating lupus? By the FDA, it's not. And there was no other drug that came along until Benlista came along, and then the drug afterward called Voclosporin, or uh, what is Voclosporin, the other name? Luke, I, I should know that. Okay. All right, so this guy's, you know, so this is looking at um, the various organs. So there's really no organ system that, that uh, lupus cannot affect. And so the typical ones are the patients that have arthralgias, we're all pretty familiar with the butterfly rash, which is pretty common. Um, sores in your mouth when you have a flare that causes aptus ulcer, those are common. And a focal or diffuse alopecia. So the hair loss is a real common problem. Of course, for women, it drives them crazy. Uh, it can involve your eyes. But the ones I want to talk about, the, the, really, the ones that are really are very important is obviously the kidneys. And we talked a little bit about that. About 60% of people will have that. And I'm going to go through the outcomes of the different types of lupus surprise. And the ones that, are, that are, are really, really dangerous is when the lupus gets into your lung. And I'll share some anecdotal experiences with that. Uh, it's a rare disorder, thank the Lord, uh, but it, uh, it's a big one when you get it. So the kidneys, you know, what, what does a kidney do? The kidneys do a lot of things. 
Uh, they regulate blood pressure. They regulate uh, electrolyte balance. So things like the sodium in your blood, the potassium in your blood, um, how much your pH is in your blood. Uh, and But what it really mainly does is get rid of the toxins that are the normal product of cell metabolism in your blood. So as you being a living person, there are metabolic products as part of a cellular function that's no longer needed and needs to be voided. So what you have here is the unit structure of the kidney called the glomerulus. That's why the name is called lupus glomerulonephritis, which is a mouthful to say. But whenever a word in medicine ends with I-T-I-S, it means inflammation. Inflammation of the glomerulus. It's not that hard. Now, there's a blood vessel that comes into this glomerulus and a blood vessel that comes out of it. And what this really is, is a tiny tuft of single cell blood vessels, capillaries, which we learned in high school biology, right? And in reality, it's about as big around as the tip of my pen. If you look at a glomerulus, you can barely see one with the un, uh, unaided eye. Between both kidneys, you roughly have about 2 million of these structures. And the goal is to keep as many of those 2 million as you can, because the lupus will destroy it over time. Now, what happens is this blood comes in here. What comes across the glomerulus is effectively plasma water. So everything that's in your blood, except red cells, white cells, and large amounts of protein. So when a patient goes to get a urinalysis and they see hematuria or red cells in the urine, proteinuria, protein in the urine, or either white cells or red cells, that can be a sign of involvement of lupus in the kidney. I'll make that point in a minute. So after this uh, filtrate goes into another section of the kidney called the nephron, and these are tubular cells that literally take back everything we need, like sodium, potassium, calcium, glucose, all that stuff, and lead all the stuff that we don't need, which we ultimately void as urine. Good? Yes? Okay. Now, what do I do? Let's see. Oh, I do it. Okay, right. Oh, my. Let's see. Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, so that slide says the same thing. Um, what happens in lupus is that when, if you have a lupus pain and you lose self-tolerance, the T cells in your blood that normally circulate through your kidney suddenly see your glomerular structures as being abnormal. And what happens is you get both what's called humoral and cell cytotoxicity damage in the kidney. So you get antibodies. You've heard of the immune complexes in lupus, right? So the immune complexes deposit within the kidney in an area called the mesangium. And when they do that, they turn on inflammatory processes that allow T cells and B cells to come into your kidney. And when they do that, I put this slide up here perfectly to show you uh, what a symphony of destruction it really becomes. And this is a very, very complicated process um, that we're still trying to break down in bits and pieces. But we've made a lot of progress is what I would really emphasize. And this shows you the same thing, that what happens is when these T cells and B cells come into the kidney, what happens is there's a breakdown in the barrier in the glomerulus. And this breakdown allows protein that's normally in your blood, mainly albumin, to go through the glomerulus and into the urine space, and it comes up as uh, protein in your urine. Protein is the single best barometer of involvement of the kidneys with lupus. Now, if you have, if you're, if you're seeing a really good rheumatologist like Dr. Machow or other ones here at Piedmont, they're going to regularly check your urine for protein. If they don't, they should be every single time you see them. I'll come back to that in just a second. Okay, so Dr. Toma, how do I know if I'm developing lupus nephritis? Does it go correlate with the hair loss or my rash or the joints? It really doesn't. Um, the main one is, like I said a moment ago, is, is, is urine and the protein, uh, protein in the urine. Now, how do I know if my doctor's not checking, how do I know that? Well, you'll find what we, we ask, the nephrologist asks this all the time. When did you first start noticing that your urine was foaming up like a big head of beer? How did you know that? 
because I know you have lupus nephritis, and that usually precedes overt clinical lupus nephritis by several months. So if you see, now I want to be careful that you don't overdo this. It's not subtle. I'll show you a picture in just a second. If you have high-grade proteinuria, the foaminess is, can actually be quite striking. And it's because the protein in the urine allows bubbles to remain in the urine foam, and it lasts longer. Other physical exam signs that you will be easy to recognize is that you wake up in the morning and your eyelids are swollen. Typically the upper and lower eyelids. Sometimes you'll even see some edema in the sclera, the white of your eye. <coughs> Excuse me. Oftentimes the hands are also swollen. And then when you go to bed at night, you'll notice that there's a little fullness around your ankles or that you put your thumb on, the, on your shin and it leaves it, an imprint. Those are signs that, in fact, that's what we refer to as the nephrotic syndrome or anasarca. Other things that can happen, which your rheumatologist and nephrologist will be doing routinely, is checking your blood values. So the best one is if your serum creatinine, and I absolutely recommend that you remember, just memorize that. Always say, hey, how is my creatinine? Why is that test so important? because it represents how good your kidney is functioning. It's real simple. The higher the creatinine, the lower the kidney function. If you go from a creatinine of one to a creatinine of two, you've lost 50% of your kidney function. Every time I say that, the room often goes silent. Okay, the last one that is uh, guys like me really deal a lot with is, and I recommend you learn this, is your serum complement levels. Now, let's, I was gonna give a little bit of, so this gets really complex really quickly. Complement are the, how do I put this? Uh, they're the SEAL Team 6 of the immune system. Uh, they're non-discriminatory, but they are powerful, powerful killing agents. They're proteins. And when they get turned on by lupus, guess where they deposit? In the kidneys, right. And they mediate much of the damage of the subsequent downstream amplification of the immune response in your kidneys. So when your complements are low, really big deal. Okay, here's an example of what I was talking about. So this is, this is the year, so even out to 15 minutes. So this is a patient who has a substantial amount of protein. That's 4,600 milligrams for 24 hours. And to put that into context, any number above 300 is considered abnormal. Okay, so you can see here, here's 46, you can see this. So after 15 minutes, the foaminess was still there. And here's a person with effectively normal protein, they have no foam in their urine. So a picture is always worth a thousand words, you know? Okay, may I ask a question? Of course, whoever asked that. That joke never works. Um, my doctor keeps telling me I'm having recurrent UTIs, at least five of them. And this all happened about 18 months before I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis. Do UTIs lead to lupus nephritis? Great question. Uh, I said that backwards intentionally. And this is a little bit sort of the sexist part of all men, right? So if a woman has hematuria or pyuria, we instantly assume they have a UTI. Here's the bad part. Uh, a lot of times they don't get formal urine cultures. One of the hallmarks of lupus nephritis is blood in the urine and what's called sterile pyuria. Fancy term. It simply means that there's white cells in the urine, but there's no infection. Why? Because there's inflammation in the kidney that's not due to a bacterium. So if a person, particularly a woman, has recurrent UTIs, I ask this question all the time. Did your doctor culture your urine? Uh, no, sir, not that I'm aware of. And so that's always a sign to me that there may or may not be. They may, certainly can have recurrent UTIs. But my point is, is that uh, there may be a lack of, this goes back to what was said earlier, be your own best advocate. So if, so, if, if you have recurrent UTIs, say, Doc, could you make sure that you culture the urine so we can find out what it is uh, because I have lupus in my family or something along those lines? So that's just a word of the wise. The answer is no. And I sort of answered this already. It says your doctors get a formal urine culture. Okay, this is an example of what pitting edema looks like. And sometimes it can be more subtle. And so if you go on a large car trip and you notice that your ankles begin to swell 
And with that, you're seeing maybe a little bit more foam in your urine. It's always good to bring it up and ask to have uh, a test that should be pretty common if you're a lupus patient called the urine to protein creatinine ratio. Y'all writing this down? Urine protein to creatinine ratio. And all that is, it tells you a way to quantify how much protein you have in your urine based on your kidney function. It's real simple, real cheap test. And um, it's like religion for me. Every single person I get gets one every time that I see them. So if you have high levels of protein, it causes your kidney to retain salt and water. And that's what you're looking at right here. This is the retained salt and water due to the proteinuria that's being lost in the kidney. So if that thumbprint persists, it's probably a pretty good amount of protein. Any questions about that? Is everybody tracking okay? Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna need help with, uh, yeah, because um, I'm a little bit hearing, uh, not the guy that was on. Why don't y'all use the microphone because then way everybody can hear it. It's, there are always good questions. Somebody else has already thought about this. So at that point, the patient has lupus nephritis? Like, is it too late at that point? Well, it's always more complicated, right? So there could be other reasons for that. Like somebody may have concurrent heart failure. Uh, they may not necessarily. But if it's a, a relatively young person and they have that, it's more likely than not that they have uh, involvement in the kidneys. Okay. Uh, for, for a person who hasn't been diagnosed yet, but um, was told like with SLE that lupus nephritis probably is going to happen or is likely, can they do things beforehand that can help protect their kidneys or is... That's an outstanding question. So surveillance. So the earlier you diagnose it, the better. So I have a bumper sticker on my car that says time is kidney. Not really, but it's funny. Uh, so the, the point is, the longer you allow somebody to have lupus nephritis, the more damage is done. Can I turn off the inflammation? Yes. Can, if you scar out that kidney, can I resurrect your kidney? No, I can't. So the sooner, the better. It's a great, great comment. But if, if you haven't been diagnosed with lupus nephritis yet, but some, your doctor has told you that that's a possibility. Yes. Are you able to do things beforehand to help protect mm -hmm. your kidneys? So if you start having increasing urine protein to creatinine ratios, you need a biopsy. All right. And does dark urine um, negate or is that a, Another a good sign? Question. Sometimes dark urine is dark because it's concentrated. And of course, in August, when it's so blazing hot, sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be that. But a lot of times, dark urine really represents occult blood. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, so blood in the urine. Yeah. Okay. Good. Keep going. You want to have a question real quick? Yeah, you spend right here. Um, I, ha I have a question. Um, as a, I have lupus nephritis, and okay. this might, I don't know if this is jumping ahead. How often would you suggest that someone get a kidney biopsy? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm laughing because um, I'm known in lupus to Friday circles as the guy that pulls people over randomly on I-75 and biopsies their kidney. Uh, a lot of times the kidney's normal, by the way. Uh, so um, I'm going to say that 10, 10 what? For what? Oh, we're not. There's oh. no chance. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, y'all really want to go into this? Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I was just wondering because I had I had one. Can I come back to that? <laughs> it's in my talk. It's it is? A, okay. Which I'm doing a terrible job of doing. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> okay. Here's the other thing that happens. So if you're, if you're a normal lupus patient and suddenly your primary care physician or your nephrologist or your room person is say, having to go up on your blood pressure medications, that's a subtle sign of development of uh, kidney in the lupus nephritis. In that situation, the chicken that lays the egg is the lupus nephritis causing the hypertension as opposed to the opposite way. Okay? All right, now, there are five different flavors of lupus nephritis. Class one, don't worry about that. Class two, don't worry. If you have class two, you're, you're doing okay. The real players are class three, class four, 
the super duper players is if you have class three with class five, I'll go in that in a minute, or the worst, which is class four plus class five. So it's membranous. I'll come back in a second. So these are the diseases. This is the level of lupus nephritis that you really want to pay attention to, class three and class four. And this is what's referred to as the proliferative form of lupus nephritis. When that happens, uh, it causes um, a very rapid kidney disease. I'm going to show you some data in a second. So we kind of go over this. I'll speed things up just a little bit. And here's the thing to remember. Uh, if you have a class three, class four, or class four, class five, without proper treatment, you have an 80% chance of being on dialysis in six years. Silence. This is class five. I want to make just a quick point about this. Class five is referred to as membranous. Generally, it's a very slow an indolent form of disease. In, if you don't get three and four with it, it's maybe 18% uh, end-stage renal disease at 10 years. <clears throat> Here's the thing that's troubling about this. It's often seen in African-Americans, and there is often very little extra renal lupus manifestations. All they have is the lupus members. And so the only thing that would be a detector of a problem is not your joints, not your rash, is the fact that you have protein in your urine and losing kidney function. So that's sort of a, a silent kind of problem, uh, particularly from the African-American community. That's just a clinical pearl. Class four, big deal. It's by definition when more than 50% of that glomerulus is, is involving proliferative lesions. Typically, those proteins I told you about complement, right? C3, C4, they're low. And why are they low? Because they're going into your kidney and wreaking havoc in your kidneys. That's super big deal. High degree progression. Study going back as early as 1983, when only we had was steroids. If you had class four with steroids, you had a 70% chance of being on dialysis within five years. No longer the case. This is historical. That's class four. So what you're looking at here, this is the glomerulus. That's that filtering unit I told you about. And you see all this purple? That's inflammation. See that area right there? That's an area of endocapillary proliferation. It's throughout this entire glomerulus. Here's another one. See this structure here? That's all a proliferation of what's called a cellular crescent. I'm going to make the point that if you have crescentic lupus nephritis, that's the worst. And I'm going to give you my personal opinion now. There will be people that will vehemently disagree with me on this. Uh, the drug that will save your kidneys is intravenous cyclophosphamide. And so if I have particularly an African-American patient with lupus nephritis that has crescents, they're going to get cyclophosphamide. Here's another example. See this? That's a crescent. That's being derived from these cells outside the glomerulus called the parietal epithelium. And if I go back one, see what this crescent's doing? That's what's left of the capillary loop. You see that? It's collapsed. And if you have a collapsed capillary loop, you can't filter. And so what happens is the kidney function rapidly declines to dialysis. Yes? Is that clear? It's a bit hard to see really important. So I, I tried this. This was kind of new for me. I actually took the photomicrograph and then drew a composite. Does that work? You like it? I did too, actually. My wife thought it was dumb. And um, so <laughs> this is an area of endocapillary proliferation. There's endocapillary proliferation, and there's the crescent right there. Okay. This is a very famous paper. It goes back to 1994. This looked at what changed the course of lupus nephritis was intravenous cyclophosphamide. And then they looked at the risk factors for who did really bad. So here again, that story I've been telling you, if your C3 is less than 76, well, Jim, what's the lowest C3 you've ever seen? 21. If you have low C3 and you have crescents, those are two independent predictors that it will not go well. And what happens is, guys, and I'm, now I'm going to preach a little bit. 
if you if uh, somebody that's not familiar with this and doesn't understand the importance of those crescents will under treat you and i'm really going to make in fact it's so important a point i'm going to make go forward on this all right now this is a this is the paper that that most of you if you have lupus and fries you're receiving this therapy right now this is called the alms trial it's done by jerry appel and ellen ginsler from nyu and it was a study where they compared CELCEP, everybody knows CELCEP, right? Okay, with intravenous cyclophosphamide. And there was a large number of African-Americans in this trial, it was a really well done study. And the bottom line was in aggregate, MMF or CELCEP was equivalent to cyclophosphamide. That's the good news, okay? And so it became the de facto standard of care the world over. If you go to Japan, South Korea, the UK, Everybody gets the same therapy globally. Now, here's the problem. The black represents the complete response. And what that means is that you got that protein less than 500 milligrams for 24 hours. I'm really going to make a point here. And here's the other side. Look at this, guys. 48% of the people in both groups had no response. Well, Jim, what... What baseball team would ever allow a guy to, uh, to strike out 50% of the time? Well, actually, a lot of them. But uh, the point being is that there's an aspect of lupus nephritis that we're not fully treating. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. If you really want me to you want me to keep going or you want me to stop? You want me to keep going? There's more to talk about. And I think you guys should hear this. Now, this is a paper that all of us who do lupus, there's a small club of us. And we run all the trials in the country, Brad Robin, Rich Lafayette, a few others. And this paper was published in 2000. This was published from the Chicago group. And there was a study at that time where they said, okay, immune complexes cause lupus to fries. What if we did a technique called plasmapheresis where I remove the immune complexes in addition to regular therapy? Do I make a better outcome? So this was a study compared to cytoxin, cyclophosphamide, with or without plasma freezes. Bottom line was plasma freezes did not make any difference. But what the Chicago group did is they kept following this same core of patients out to 10 years. This was published in 2008. We all read it and no one understood it, myself included. I read this, I go, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then 10 years later, it means, oh my goodness. What they showed was they broke the patient down to complete response. So if you have less than 500 milligrams, what happened to you over 10 years? Only 6% of those patients that achieved less than 500 milligrams of protein progressed in their dialysis. Now, when we were all fellows, we were taught in this group, which is a partial response, where you got at least 50% reduction in that protein. So you went from 5,000 milligrams of protein down to 2,500 that... That was good. And if you look, here's five years. Compared to the non-responders, it's clearly better. Here's the revelation. If you take a partial responder and you don't get them into complete remission, at the end of 12 years, they're no different than a non-responder. Do you get that? In other words, what that says is partial response is not enough. It changed everything about the way I treat. And does that, well, Jim, are you saying that you have to be more aggressive? Yes, it does mean that. But the payoff is not dialysis. Amen? All right. So my doctor says if I get my protein less than 500 milligrams, a day, that's good, right? Yes, it is right. So why does this guy tell me keep saying I need to get a follow-up biopsy to answer this person's questions? What's wrong with that guy? Well, he's the guy that uh, biopsies people on I-75. Here's the story. This is a paper. It's a whole series of these papers. I just picked a couple of them. This is a paper where they took 69 lupus patients like you guys that had lupus nephritis, and then they treated them, and they re-biopsied them six months afterwards. When I was still at Emory, I started doing this in my African-American patients because the risk was so much higher. I do it now with every young lady that I have. If they have lupus nephritis, at the end of six months, you're getting another biopsy. I'll tell you why. 
Because look what they found. After standard induction therapy with cyclophosphamide, pulse solumedrol, the big league stuff, a full 19% of those patients still had the proliferative form of lupus nephritis. So, Jim, you're saying that even though my protein went down and my creatinine got better, I still have the disease? Yes. Now, remember, I showed you this slide a moment ago, right, about this abysmal partial response rate and how bad they do if there's a partial response. Part of the reason for that is we never finish treating the patient. Because the biomarkers we have, the clinical biomarkers of what we constitute effective therapy, a drop in serum creatinine, a drop in proteinuria, yes, I feel better, doesn't mean that the disease in the kidney has been eliminated. Does that make sense? And so this is a part where you can be your own best head. So if, if your doctor asks you for a repeat biopsy, it means that he or she is on the money and they understand the disease process. That's a Zickert paper. Uh, my buddy, uh, Brad Robin, collaborated with a, a group of uh, Argentine physicians that did this as a matter of force. They were 10 years ahead of the U.S. They were doing this. And when, he, when Brad did his study, 52% of the patients had residual disease in the kidney. Okay, I won't beat a dead horse. I think I made my point. Now, I alluded to this, it really is true that African-Americans have a worse outcome than other groups. Now, this study was to try to address potential disparities in access to medical care. This was an NIH-funded trial. Everybody got treated exactly the same. Same protocols done by Marianne Dooley when she was at Chapel and Jerry Appel, Mr. Lupus at Columbia. And so they got prednisone and they got cyclophosphamide. This is all standard stuff. And what they did is they looked at the Caucasian rate of cure, 95%. Total population was 71%, but only 58% among African Americans. Now, the fact that everybody got treated the same, that says, well, is there some type of biologic reason why that is? And, and no one, we thought that, but no one knew until this. So how many of the, of the audience is familiar with the APOL1 story? Can I digress for a second? Okay, you need to know this. This may be one of the most consequential findings in medicine in the last 25 years. It's done by a guy named Martin Pollock at the Beth Israel. APOL1 is a, is a gene that you get one gene from mom, one gene from dad. And it's typically in African people of African descent from Western Africa, given the Ivory Coast, Tanzania, Kenya, where there is an endemic parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi. You know it is African sleeping sickness. It's a misnomer. It's not sleeping sickness. It's a parasitic encephalitis and a nasty one. If you have gene from mom and gene from dad, you're protected against the parasite. A way to think about this, these proteins are a little bit like complement. What they do is they attach to the parasite and they pour it and destroy it. Now, that's the good news, right? The bad news is if you have any other associated illness, if you're hypertensive, if you're a diabetic, if you have lupus, it amplifies the aggressiveness of the disease. This is coming out in droves. In fact, this is a study that was published two weeks ago, and this looked at people that even had a gene from one parent, not both parents, one parent, if you're APOL1 single allele positive, your outcomes in lupus was significantly worse. And I'm seeing this in my practice all the time. To the point where every African-American patient that I have that has lupus, basically anything, diabetes, I don't care. I'm testing everybody. So this is a really, now, okay, is this academic, Jim? Who cares? Well, it's more than that. There is a company that is actively, it's in phase three trials now. We're doing the trial where they have a small molecule blocker of this pathway. This is going to change everything. It is. Big deal. Super well-designed drug. I won't preach anymore. All right. All right. I want to go over a couple new kids on the block. Who's familiar with Binlista? Okay, anybody on Binlista currently? Okay, great. All right. That's a really good drug. 
And when it came out, to be quite frank with you, I was not a believer. <laughs> I looked at it and I go, eh. And uh, so I started using it, and, uh, and I found that it really did make people feel better. And the way Benlista works, it's a B-cell drug. It's a beta lymphocyte drug, and it blocks a pathway called BATH. And so what it does is it, it turns out that B-cells are really, really important in propagating and extending the inflammation of lupus. So it made a lot of sense that if we block this pathway, can we sort of turn down the rheostat on the intensity of the disease? That's exactly what it does. And I'll give you a side point on this. What really got me using it was those, how many people really suffer with fatigue? Okay, you all do, right? So Benlista was the drug at the time that was the most effective in reducing it. And that's actually why I started using it. And then what came along was the Benlista LN trial. So they asked the obvious question, well, if I give Benlista to Cellcept and, uh, and steroids, is it additive in improving the renal function? And it is. And that's what this study did. I'm going to go quickly through this. It lowered proteinuria in these individuals and increased the rate of complete or partial response rate. But the delta, to be honest with you guys, here is, you know, a little bit. It's a definite add-on. So, but people have taken this and moved on with it in other ways. And I, we could talk about that after the lecture if you want, because it would be too long to go. Okay. And it also improved out all the way out to two years. It made a difference. Do I use Ben Listen every day, all day? And it really has a role. Now, the other kid on the block that's come along, who's heard of leukinus or Voclosporin? Okay. Now, so when I ran my lab at Emory, and this is so much fun for me, I was a calcineurin guy, the drug, the enzyme that this enzyme blocks. And when this came about, I mean, they called me up because of papers I wrote in the early 1990s. And I said, you read that paper, really? And they said, yeah, we want you to come by and talk to us about it. I go, great, love to. So uh, this is the new cyclosporin, the new tacrolimus. And here's the add-on about this. Uh, still not proven. I've got a rat study that I've done that, really suggest this. This drug, you know how those drugs can damage your kidneys on their own? Did your doctor tell you that? Cyclosporin can scar your kidneys just by itself. Tacrolimus can scar your kidneys just by itself. Voclosporin looks like it is less able to do that and becomes a drug you can put somebody on long term. That's one real advantage. But the real advantage is that unlike Benlista, which only affects B cell function Leukinus affects T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, and more importantly, it directly protects the kidney. So let's go over that because that's important to understand. They did a study where they did prednisone, Cellcept, or the other group got prednisone, Cellcept, and um, Voclosporin, two-year study. And they looked and asked the question, how many people went into a complete remission? And so a complete remission, they defined as, again, less than 500. You had no prednisone rescue. You had no decrement in your renal function. You had to hit all four of those criteria to say that you hit the primary endpoint of the study. Very, very rigorous study. And what they found was they compared to uh, prednisone and MMF, only 22% of the patients achieved this number. Now, in all fairness, that's way better than what Ellen Gizner did in the original paper, I showed, which was 8%. They got it to 22. But look at this. If you add the voclosporin to your standard therapy right now, it goes to 41%. Still means that 59% had to have another way of being treated, but that's a big jump. Really important. And it worked in all classes of lupus and products, class 3, class 4, class 5, and... The killers I told you about, 3, 4, and th uh, that it combined with, with class 5. And it was beneficial the most in African Americans. Now, let's be fair. There was a relatively smaller number of patients in this trial that were African Americans. But, but, you know, I mean, it is what it is. And you take that data and realize that it may be a statistical anomaly. I actually believe that it's not. And I think that it really is because my personal experience has been true. And now, so what we did is we compared, Brad and I did a debate about this a few years ago, 
Voclo or Lucanus versus Belimumab, and the spread and time and the degree of complete renal response, I think is more vigorous in Voclosporin. So Jim, do you use Voclo alone or do you use Belista alone? No, Brad and I use both drugs together every day, all day. Why? Because they work by different mechanisms. So if you're able to negotiate the navigation waters of your insurance company and get both, which you're laughing, but it's really true, it's, it's a nightmare. Uh, if you get them both on there, you really, really have a combination that has a potential to put people in very, very flat changes in their kidney function. Yes? Okay. Uh, I've probably taken up more than I'm supposed to do. Uh, that's it. I'll stop there. This is my dog, Daisy. And uh, so thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking to you. My apologies to everybody behind me. <laughs> Oh, it's fun. Thank you so much. And you'll be back. We're going to have you on the panel here. So, oh, yeah. so bring your questions. Thank you, your questions. We're going to do a panel after this oh, yeah. where we can ask the doctors some questions, and we're going to bring up a couple of patients as well. We're going to take a quick... Am I not loud enough? Relax. We're going to take a quick 10-minute break here to get up there and um, get some refreshments, stretch your legs, and we will come back in 10 minutes. And at that time... We have the privilege of having Quinn Cousin from Arinia, who is our sponsor today, come on and talk to us. So go ahead, stretch your legs, and we will reconvene at about 5 of 11. Hello again. We're going to get this started right now, so people want to take their seats and settle in here. I'll go. Once. Okay, it is my pleasure at this time to introduce Quinn Cousin from Arrhenia Pharmaceuticals. They are our sponsor today for this program. We can't do the kind of work we do without their support, so we appreciate them. And Quinn is awesome, absolutely awesome. Okay, Quinn is the Advocacy and Strategic Alliance Manager um, for the Southeast for Arrhenia Pharmaceutical Company. Her role is non-sales, disease state and patient advocacy role centered around elevating awareness of the impact active management and surveillance can have on improving kidney health in lupus nephritis patients. We work closely, she works closely with the rheumatology and nephrology leaders, academic and medical institutions where the focus is on institutional access solutions through EMR integration, unbranded disease state education, clinical journal reviews. Lastly, her role, she is involved in engagement strategies with leaders involved in patient advocacy, advocacy through the local and regional societies to empower patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. This is what it's all about, y'all, empowerment. And empowerment comes from knowledge. And knowledge comes through all the education that's being provided here today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Quinn Cousin. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Terry. So I'm going to try to do this without um, clearing my throat. OK. So why am I here? Why, why, why am I interested in this topic? Um, I was actually working for a different company when presented with the opportunity to come to Arrhenia Pharma, and I said no twice. And then my 22-year-old daughters, uh, at the time 18, year, 18 years old, um, had already been diagnosed with lupus. We didn't know what it was. They were, they were college roommates, and she just told me she was, she was sick. And two years later, her mom was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer. And that is at the same time that I was asked to come to Arrhenia and still not really un fully understanding lupus and or lupus nephritis. I was like, nah, I, you know, I'm comfortable working for AstraZeneca and really looking forward to eventual retirement in about 10 years. And um, then we found out that she had lupus nephritis. And I felt like it was um, a personal calling for me to get involved because what we're, what we're seeing and understanding is that this 
um, disease, lupus and lupus nephritis, predominantly affects African American women or people of color. Not that it doesn't affect people, um, Caucasian people as well. So I decided to take on this charge and working with Arenia to make sure that we better understand what it is we need to do in order to be healthy. But what Arenia discovered is that there's a huge disparity in care when it comes to taking care of people who are living with lupus. And we're trying to help solve for that. So my role is to try to raise awareness. You guys heard um, Dr. Machua and Dr. Tomlin talk a lot about advocating for yourself. Well, if you don't know what you should be advocating for and your doctors are not necessarily engaging with you at a level at which you need to understand that you need to advocate for yourself, then you may not do that. And the numbers and um, the morbidity continues um, in, in our uh, demographic. So with that, let's see if it will go, if I can make this work. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So we got involved with um, the Lupus Foundation of America as well as um, the National Kidney Foundation and other, and other advocacy organizations to try to help solve for some of the reasons why people were not living well with lupus. And some of the ways that we've gotten involved is to try to help solve for some of the transportation issues with Uber Health. We've tried to help solve for some of the technology issues by going into towns like, for example, Brunswick, Georgia, and if you guys can imagine, I, I couldn't imagine this, but they were living during a pandemic without the internet. So broadband, um, the CLC came in and we partnered with them to provide um, broadband to people living in housing, um, <clears throat> public housing and childcare. One of the biggest issues that we've heard um, is that, you know, I can't get to my appointments because first of all, I have five of them and I don't have time to take off work and I also don't have time to try to figure out who's going to take care of my children. So making sure that child care is readily available and affordable. And if you can't afford that, then we make sure that we partner with organizations who can help provide you with those resources. There are also language barriers that are causing issues for, for people living with lupus to get the best care possible. So one of the things that we did was we started around the country. There are seven patient navigator grants that we gave. And we try our best to make sure that those people who are helping people navigate this disease within the institutional space are bilingual. And lastly, food deserts. <clears throat> if we tell you to, that you need to eat well and eat better, if there's a food desert, how are you going to do that? So we make sure that you have access to things like um, Walmart, um, being able to order online, Amazon, ordering online. So because you live in a particular socioeconomic status or a particular area where there might be a food desert doesn't mean you can't have access to good food. <clears throat> Excuse me for clearing my throat. I'm trying to get over whatever this is. So what we know is, is that all of these things impact your ability to get to your medical appointments, as I said, um, that people living with lupus have unpredictable flares. So you can't decide or determine how you feel, when you feel like going to the doctor and if you can get there. We also wanna make sure that people are aware of the medications that are available for them. <clears throat> I'm on the non-branded side, but, but we wanna make sure that you have access to them. And so one of the things that we do is we work with legislators, <clears throat> excuse me, to remove barriers to access, meaning that Dr. Tomlin talked about your ability to get Benlista and um, loop kindness at the same time. Our goal is to try to work with legislators to make sure that those barriers are removed. <clears throat> I already talked about Wi-Fi. So you guys, Dr. Um, Machua presented the information um, regarding Dr. King and his words about health equity. Well, it's true. But the problem is, is that <clears throat> Health equality does not mean health equity. Health equity really means that everybody has access to the best care possible without systemic barriers. And it's our goal to remove those. It's our goal for everyone to be able to go to the doctor and get the same care, the best care 
and it doesn't matter your skin color. <clears throat> you guys already heard all these statistics, so I'm gonna run through this in the interest of time. So I talked about the Georgia, the, 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 our goal of working with legislators to ensure that you have access to care. So the Georgia case study is just one of those examples. One of the things that we also do is that we work on um, public service. Uh, we work with public servants to ask them to provide public service announcements about lupus. So um, Representative Schofield is one of those people who actually recorded a message and she put it on her, um, on her social accounts to raise awareness. Um, our goal around the country, it, there are six of us that, that do what I do. I cover five states um, to try to make sure that people are aware of lupus and lupus nephritis and how to, how to seek help and how to um, advocate for themselves. And one of the ways that we do this is through what's called a legislative town hall. So we actually pull together a legislator, a physician like Dr. Mature, Dr. Tomlin to talk about the disease state as well as a person living with lupus to share their story. And you guys would be um, amazed as to how many people come out, just like you guys. We did one of these at the um, National Black Nurses Association that just occurred. Um, and there were mm, probably 30,000 nurses at this event who got to hear our information and see this information and really better understand how to um, recognize the symptoms of lupus and take care of patients living with lupus. So I'm gonna run through this really quickly because I've already talked about a lot of this. So we have this campaign. Um, we talked a lot about how do we raise awareness? How do we make sure that you are aware and people living with lupus are aware of the care that's available as well as um, the resources that are available to ensure that you connect the dots, that you feel like there's a round sound care for you. And we've talked a lot about the fact that testing is important. Um, Dr. Tomlin spoke about it, Dr. Machua talked about it. But whenever I go out to these different events and I talk to people, they don't really know how often they should be getting tested or the different things they should be getting tested for. And Dr. Tomlin spoke about the fact that getting your urine tested, your UPCR, is one of the most important things you can do. And it should be done quarterly. So I'll put some numbers around these. It should be done quarterly at a minimum. And we know that peeing in a cup sucks. This is our campaign. And it gets a lot of attention. It's meant to be in your face. It's meant to force you to think about what are you doing to protect yourself? Because really, honestly, nobody's going to take care of you better than you, period. Not even your mom or your dad. It's, it's really up to you to care about yourself and make sure that you're getting the testing that's needed. So we partnered with Tony Braxton. I don't know if you guys have seen this campaign. She is living with lupus and lupus nephritis. Her story is pretty impactful. And probably like many of you, she really didn't know what was going on with her. Um, she obviously has you know, quite a bit of money in order to get the best care possible. But like I said, we wanna level that, that playing field. So we use her voice. We use her voice. This campaign has gotten over 3 million hits. We also have educational resources that are available for, for you to understand your labs, which is incredibly important to understand, like this QR code will tell you about Tony's story, but I have another QR code that's coming up that will link you to our resources to help you link to the LFA. If you'd like to link to, to, to the LFA, to link you to newsletters, to link you to one of the most important tools I think um, that we have available that we created with partners like Dr. Tomlin, Dr. Machua and other doctors um, letting us know, hey, how would you like for your patients to be better prepared when they come to the doctor's office? What do you want them to know? What do you want them to ask you? In this 15 minutes, <laughs> how can they make the most of their time? So there's a tool on there to help, to help you better ask those questions that would be most appropriate for you to ask when you go to your doctor's appointments. There's also a link to newsletters that, are, that you can sign up for to get the latest information about what's going on in this community. So we know you guys have heard, you've been scared straight by Dr. Tomlin about lupus nephritis and um, taking care of your kidneys. And the bottom line is, is that it's true. 
I have traveled this country. I am on a plane every single week fighting for awareness and making sure that people know. It's near and dear to me. It's extraordinarily important that you take care of yourself because you're the only person that's actually going to do it. You're the only person that can walk in that doctor's office, ask for a UPCR test, and pee in that cup. You're the only person, nobody can do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. You have to want it for yourself. So somebody asked the question, is there anything preventative that I can do? This is what you can do. This is the single most important thing that you can do. You can show up. It sucks, but you can show up, you can pee in this cup, and you can hand it to the doctor. You're not the only people that have to pee in cups. You're not the only person that have, that, you know, that, that, that have to have tests. So I want you guys to know you're not alone in that. And so these are some signs and symptoms and they can't be ignored. This is the QR code. If you guys will take out your phones, <clears throat> excuse me, and scan this QR code, it'll take you to those resources that, that, I, that I spoke about. It'll take you to that website. I always give out my cell phone number. <clears throat> so if you're ready, it's 404. <clears throat> excuse me, 931. 2688. And you can just text me and say, hey, Quinn, I was at, you know, the talk on Saturday and I, and I need help. And I will connect you to either Terry or any other resources that we have to make sure that you are on and stay on the best path possible to have, to, to live well with lupus, really. All right. Thank you so much. Um, our thank you slide is probably coming up last, or it's going to repeat itself going backwards. Anyway, thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for your time. Quinn, thank you so much for that information. And she means it when she says she'll connect us with resources because she has done it with several patients and we've been able to help them out in a variety of different ways from connecting them with um, other doctors to connecting them with other people living with lupus and just providing the resources that we have here at the foundation. So at this point, we are going to bring up our panel and we have Dr. Tumlin and Dr. Mashwa. We have Chris Reed and Betty McPherson are going to come up. If you'll please come up to the stage here. Before, while they're coming up here, um, while they're coming up here, I want you to take a look in your folders. There is a, a postcard with a QR code on it for lupus nephritis support group. This, we've gotten a lot of interest around this group. This is going to be virtual. The first meeting is September 14th, and we'll do that via Zoom. We'd like to do a hybrid of this group and perhaps have some in-person programs where perhaps we bring in a speaker and just allow people to do it virtually as well. The reason we're doing it virtually is because we want to reach people from across the state. We don't just want to limit it to the metro Atlanta area. We want people living with lupus anywhere to be able to um, be able to access this group. We've got another virtual group just for in general living with lupus and it's been very well received. It's been a great platform, but it's a great opportunity for people to come to share their experiences. That's what a support group is about. So it's sharing your experience and what works for you. And in doing that, you help other people see that something that they perhaps they could try. It's just a great way to share in a confidential manner what it is to be living with lupus nephritis. So I encourage you to sign up for that just to get information. It doesn't mean you even have to attend the first meeting, but if you click on that QR code and just do the consent for it, you'll get information about every upcoming meeting. Thank you. Hold on one sec.
just do, yeah, let's just do, that's the first one. I wanted to do it so I could see your face. Right, sorry. Okay, we have this esteemed panel here of just these lovely people who know a lot about living with lupus and lupus nephritis. And I'm just gonna go down the line and just let you just tell your story just quickly. And we'll start with you, Dr. Mashwa. Just tell, how did you get involved with the Lupus Foundation and what is your connection? And anything you feel like sharing. You're really trying, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So what you all don't know is Terry is trying to get me out of my lupus closet. Um, the, the way we actually met with Terry is because my um, program director, who is my mentor and my friend, Dr. Alice Oliver at the Medical College of Georgia, found out that I had lupus and had been on my deathbed and in 2007 and um, I was in a coma for 11 days and she really encouraged me to get out of my lupus closet and speak out and that's how we met with Terry the first time I spoke in a lupus uh, foundation of America Georgia chapter meeting um, so that's me so I am a survivor uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a thriver and I'm blessed um, I have faith and God has taken care of me, a lot of my doctors, uh, family, and that's how I actually chose to become a rheumatologist. And when I woke up from my coma and I was, I had a month in the hospital and several other hospital encounters, I guess God spoke to me and I chose to be a rheumatologist. And as the people around me know, I'm like, uh, lupus is not going to get me. I'm going to make a difference. Um, uh, with 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 doing better, taking care of patients, research, um, helping others with my story. So that's me. Thank you so much. Okay. So next up, we have Betty McPherson. And Betty, you've been involved in the chapter for as long as I've been there. I mean, I was there, and I think you were part of the founding of the Decatur Support Group, Decatur Laces. Okay, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus in 1996. And, um, but I didn't think Here. I had Betty, lupus. bring the mic a little bit closer to you, please. Sorry. So I didn't think I had lupus because I didn't have any any real symptoms. I went to the doctor and you know, really wasn't anything. My blood work was out of whack, but you know, I didn't it didn't stop anything. But in 2000, lupus affected my kidneys and I whispered to Dr. Tomlin that he was my doctor. He was my nephrologist and I always say he saved my life. Um you know I was going to do this, but um but I had total trust in Dr. Tomlin. And that meant a, meant a lot for today because I went through an aggressive treatment for my lupus in 2000, 2001. And for years, I did really well. But the last couple of years, it's affected my kidneys again. So my new nephrologist, when we were talking about treatment and he was talking about a lot of different options and I don't know him, I didn't know Dr. Tomlin either when I met him, but when my new nephrologist was talking about treatment, the one thing I said to him was, well, I was told if lupus, if you're African-American and lupus affects your organs, you need to be very aggressive. And he seemed a little, you know, okay. And I don't, I don't know what aggressive means in my current situation, but I did let him know that I was, I wanted to do whatever I could. I didn't want to try this, try this, try, you know, that. I wanted to go full force because I learned that um, from Dr. Tomlin. 
So I'm going through my second round now of a different type of, not a different type. When I was diagnosed with Dr. Tumman, I had lupus nephritis class three. Now I am lupus nephritis class five membranous, which is different from the proliferative. And of course, I'm gonna pick Dr. Tumlin's brain at some point about this sort of as a check. But I would like to encourage everyone, as has been said before, read, ask questions, get as much information as you can get. So when you go to your doctor, you can say, well, what about this? And my rheumatologist, Dr. Walter, I've had over 20 years. So when I met my new nephrologist, when I talked to my um, um, uh, rheumatologist, whom I've had for so long and trust, I would just tell him everything because I felt like he would then guide me with my new nephrologist because he knows him. And he'll say, well, okay, I'll talk to him about that to help me get comfortable with my uh, new nephrologist. So it's important for us to take this on ourselves, not to count on the doctor, because I've often said, when you go to that doctor's office, when they walk in your patient room and taking your chart off the door, I think that's the first time they saw it since the last time they saw it. So it's not like they're out there studying your case specifically because they got 50 patients a day. So it's important for us to take this into our own hands and learn whatever we can learn about our own illness so that we can help guide the doctor. So we can say, well, what about my creatinine? And last time it was this and cause them to pull your chart and say, yeah, you're right. Let me double check that to make sure, you know, that everything um, is really okay. And then the other thing I would say, join a support group if you're not in one. It's not a, a place where, you know, we have a pity party and all of that. We really talk to each other. And in our group, uh, the LACES Decatur support group, we say, you come to the meeting, you get one pity party. So come cry, woe is me, all night long if you want. But after that, you have to grab hold. And, and take control of your illness. We know how bad it is, but it's not, you know, a place to just come and say, oh, I got this and I can't do anything. There's a lot that we can do. And educating ourselves is one of the things that will help us a lot. And I hope that the fact that I say I've been living with lupus in, since 1996 is an encouragement, even with nephritis, and it was for me when I learned that, that people had kidney disease and lived 20, 30 years, that was encouragement to me because when I was diagnosed with nephritis, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna go on dialysis and I'm gonna die. Well, I am gonna die, <laughs> but you know, not today, that's it, not today. And so we have to fight and that, that is my fight. Lupus is not going to kill me if I can help it. So we have to fight, fight for ourselves. And before we go on, I just want to say Betty certainly has longevity in her genes. Her mother just turned 103. Wow. 103. And Betty is taking care of her mother now and doing that. So that's just an amazing accomplishment. But I love what you said about support groups and about the pity potty. There's a, there's a school of thought that says people will keep saying the same thing over and over again and complaining about the same thing over and over again until they feel heard. That's the beauty of a support group. You can go into a safe, confidential space and talk about what's bothering you. And when you feel heard, you process it and you move on. So I'm with Betty. I, I really encourage you all to join a support group. And now I will pass this on to Dr. Tumlin. Well, thank you. Uh, so seeing Betty again, my goodness, that's 20 years ago. And we had lost track. Uh, what do you know? It? I'm so sorry. Hang on a second. I apologize. 
Um, that's why I went into medicine. Every once in a while, you'll get a story like this. It's just fantastic. It's so good to see Betty. My goodness, it brings back a thousand memories. How did I get into lupus? Um, I can remember the day. So I was an intern at Grady Hospital in 1986, and there was this young woman who was in the ICU. And in those days, Grady had almost no resources. And there was this rheumatologist who was on staff, and and um, she developed that thing I talked about, the involvement in the lungs. And she was on a machine. She was ventilating. She was coughing up blood. Her kidneys were in failure. And this rheumatologist was bold enough to give her high-dose cyclophosphamide. And we watched that woman come off the vent, come off dialysis, and survive. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And uh, it sort of set me on a course to, to really get interested. And I've been doing lupus now for... I don't know how long I've been doing. Long time, 30, 35 years, thirty-five, something like that. Yeah, and so it's just a real pleasure to see. You, know, you take a young woman whose world is just falling apart, and you give her back her life. And then, can I tell one quick anecdote? So uh, I had this woman, little tiny Caucasian woman, and she was referred to by one of the local rheumatology persons. And she says, "Doctor Tumblin, I have lupus in my kidneys. I have one request of you." And I go, "Yes, ma'am." She goes, I want to be a mother. Got it. Okay, totally get it. And told her she had to have this drug, which could put her ovaries at risk. But there's now ways that we can protect ovaries very effectively, actually. And so we gave her this uh, therapy, put her to remission. And um, she uh, delivered the child, but got pregnant, delivered the child early because she developed her lupus, came back during the pregnancy, delivered the kid, and then, then, Three months after the pregnancy, the tsunami hit. And she had the same condition in her lungs. And I got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, from some ICU guy at Wellstone, which is a hospital I don't go to. And he says, your gal's here. What do we do? I said, who are you and how did you get this number? <laughs> and um, so I called up Jeff Lieberman, uh, who was her main officer. And so the next morning on Sunday, we drove to Wellstone. And I, I don't know how it happened. I went in there. I don't have privileges at this hospital. I've got nothing. They don't know me from Adam. And we went in there and said, you got to do this, this, and this for her. And we gave her a new drug called Ekiluzumab, which we can talk about later. And it saved her life. And let me tell you, that's just the best feeling in the world. And she, so Jeff and I went to the baby's christening at one year. It was really fabulous. And so it's a, a part of a continuum of everyone's lives going through. So really, really good stuff. I hope that helps. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we've got Chris Reed. So Chris, and Chris loves to share his story. So, so I was diagnosed with lupus uh, in 1990. Um, and I dealt with heart, lung, um, GI issues for, for quite a long time. Uh, went into a series of remissions for a while. And uh, in the late, 19, late 1990s, um, I actually went to go see Dr. Tumlin um, after my mom, my mom was looking for a nephrologist for me to see uh, just in case, because I'd already, I'd always had some spillage of protein and, and blood in my urine, but nothing that was off the charts. Um, so Dr. Tumlin, I saw Dr. Tumlin for, for a number of years while I was finishing college. And I went off to, after I graduated from college. I went to law school in New Orleans, and Dr. Tumlin set me up with a nephrologist in New Orleans, and um, it was a great experience. I went through three years of law school, no health problems whatsoever, so complete remission during that time. And then in 2004, um, not too long after graduation uh, from law school, I developed lupus nephritis class three. And I had a doctor here in Atlanta. I moved back to Atlanta and had a doctor here, Dr. Stephen Paston, who followed me uh, and continues to follow me to this day. Uh, he treated me uh, very aggressively um, with cyclophosphamide. And uh, I, think, I think really between Dr. Tumlin and Dr. Paston, they both saved my life uh, just making sure that I've been able to succeed in life. Um, there's really, I want to echo what Betty said about 
uh, certainly being um, active and being an advocate for yourself um, because you can't let lupus just sit around and, and take over your life. You have to be the manager of your lupus. You have to be the manager of your lupus. Um, and in addition to that, be active uh, in lupus um, events, programs, coming events like this. I mean, this, this is definitely a first step to uh, really managing and taking care of your lupus by attending events like this through the Lupus Foundation. Uh, I've been a part of the Lupus Foundation since 1990. I remember very, very well uh, attending my uh, first uh, support group uh, and thought, really thought I was going to die. And it was really the Lupus Foundation of America Georgia chapter that really made me feel a little bit more comfortable about living with lupus, learning about lupus, and uh, being able to be an active person, uh, not only with the foundation, but being an active person in and of myself. Um, so definitely get involved as much as possible. I run a men's support group for uh, people living with lupus as well as work on advocacy for the foundation. And I think those types of activities help me give back uh, to people like yourself uh, who are struggling and dealing with lupus. So definitely uh, you can always reach out to me. I'm on the website uh, if you need any assistance. I'm definitely here for men who have lupus and uh, believe me, uh, you can really survive this condition. Chris, thanks. Thank you so much. How old? Tell them how old you were when you went to that first support group. Oh, I was 16. Here, you, that mic can get turned on, I think. Oh, sorry. I was 16. You were 16 years old. Your mother dragged you to that meeting, right? Yep. And introduced you to a lot of people. But you're 16 years old, a male living with lupus, which is a rare thing. Um, I really have to just thank this this panel up here, you know, Betty, for the work that you do, not only with the LASIS support group, but with our advocacy. You've been one of our ambassadors for our, our Lupus Advocacy Day. I know you and Kim Schofield went down to the Capitol and knocked on every door until they get, get somebody to sponsor our first advocacy day in 2008. I think that was it. Yep, you guys got the whole, got the whole thing started. You have doing, Chris, it's an amazing accomplishment. And we really have, we have the most active state advocacy program in the country for lupus, the state of Georgia. We are the model for what other people are doing. And it's because of the work, the groundwork that Betty and, and um, Kim set. And then Chris, you picked up that rain and took over the, the, the support group. I mean, the, the advocacy group. And you guys are just... Um, this is all part of this patient journey that I talked about before. This journey of going from identifying symptoms to being diagnosed to coming to terms with your, your disease state and then getting involved. And that is empowerment. That's the, that's the place we want to get people to is that place of empowerment where they feel a sense of control. You know, there's a lot of things we can't control, but being active helps us control the things we can. So I applaud you. Applaud you all for, do, for doing that. At this time, I'd like to see if there's any questions in the audience. I know we didn't get much time for a Q&A, but does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, prejudging you because you don't look sick. Um, I like right now. I have a problem, and I'm I'm all the way to the top with the uh, VP of pharmacy at Publix because I have one that keeps writing these ridiculous notes on everyone, every one of my prescriptions. I got 23 prescriptions, take 67 pills a day. 
So for me, I shouldn't have to go to Publix five days a week to pick up medication. You, you know, like I know every one of you know, the sun is not our best friend. UV light is not our best friend. And so for me to get up, you know, and have to go, and sometimes twice a day, because this lady purposefully, if my meds can be filled on day 25, she won't fill them until day 30. Mm. If I fill them on any other day, I mean, this is, this is metro Y. I, I've been to CVS to the point where I've tried to fill prescriptions and the tech will walk right over to the doctor and they'll say, no, we don't have this. And just hand it right back to me, no eye contact. I wait 30 minutes, send my girlfriend and they'll fill it. Same prescription. Yeah. Yeah. And this has become a problem for me for years, but as of recent, it's increased, especially with moving or changing a pharmacy because now you're rebuilding a relationship with the pharmacies and then they change pharmacies. Right. And so if the doctors are doing their job and prescribing you the correct medications, then you can't get those medications. Like I had been Lista prescribed to me. I had to go through, I want to say, uh, at least six different people. No explanation. Or oh, this is a specialty drug. Click. Oh, we don't have this. Click. Okay, so. Hey, so what you need to do is you need to be in touch with us at the Lupus Foundation and get involved. Get, I'd love to have you get involved with advocacy, right, Chris? Get involved and let's really get to the root of it. But give me a call and let's talk more about this and let's see what we can do because that's awful. That is awful. One of the things that you brought up, though, is something that we hear so often. You know, I said it to before I alluded. I've got muscular dystrophy. I, I have a... A walker, people. I have a, a scooter. People help me because I look sick. I look sick. They hold bags for me. They hold doors for me. They do that. So many of you don't look sick, and that becomes a problem, especially when you go to an emergency room in crisis. And Chris, I'd like you to comment on that because I know you've had this situation. You go to, and and they think that you're looking for drugs, right? That's the first thing that was said to me when I was diagnosed. And when I, I was sweating in the middle of February, temperature, I had sore throat for a long time. I went into the doctor and he was a Caucasian doctor and he looked at me and he said, if you're looking for narcotics, I don't, I don't prescribe those. Yeah. I said, excuse me? No one has all these, all these symptoms you're saying. And then all it took was one week, Thursday come, blood work come back. He didn't want to see me. He sent the tech out. He says, your ANA is positive. He says, it's three times over what it should be. We need to send you to a rheumatologist. Yeah, yeah. And never heard from that guy again. Okay, so on this panel, any suggestions on that, on dealing with pharmacies or difficulties or just dealing with? Um, I mean, I'm like you. I, I have a rollator. I have to. I'm I'm six six to forty two now. I was two ninety at my height with the prednisone. I have to use my rollator even if I don't have to in order to be able to fill my prescriptions. So I have to keep it in my car even though I may not need it. And I wear I wear leg braces, but those are heavy, so I can't, I don't. But it's sad that I have to walk in there with the rollator at six, six. And of course, you know, they're low. So now I'm rolling in there like this yeah, just to get my meds. Yeah. And yeah. It, you shouldn't have to do that. Right. And I don't know who else is going through it, but I'm sure somebody in here is going through it. Right. And, and I've not, I've not heard that problem specifically with pharmacies. I've heard it with, with emergency rooms. Betty, you've seen it with pharmacies. I have not had a problem. But yeah. I <laughs> yeah. I used okay. to. I used to until finally the doctors all started notating it. My rheumatologist, I got a new rheumatologist. She, she notated it. My general practice doctor, he notated it. So now when they're pulling me up, they're seeing MCTD. They're seeing lupus SLE. They're seeing osteoarthritis. They're seeing, you know, uh, 
everything. They're seeing everything. And so now they're like, okay, we still don't know what to do. Let's just give them some, let's give them some Dilaudid and just let them lay here for 12 hours. Yeah. And that's their, that's their treatment. So you're getting scripts from doctors and you go in there and the pharmacies won't fill the script from the doctor. Mm -mm. Okay. Let's, and, and let's talk them offline. Digitally. And they, they'll sit there for a whole week, sometimes two weeks. And yeah. I have to physically go in there and say, hey, I'm here okay. to pick up a prescription for high yeah. And they'll say, they'll say oh, they're, they're, they're not ready. They'll be ready in a few minutes. And now I'm waiting two and a half, three hours when there's no other customers there, no nothing. They make me sit there and wait. Yeah. Okay, you know there's, what? Give, the, give, the, give us a call at the office and let's talk more about this. Yes. So we there, can find there's it. definitely something to be said about mail order pharmacies. Um, when you don't necessarily have a, a local pharmacy that, that is useful and helpful to you. Uh, I've, I've certainly found that the mail order pharmacists are much more, provide much more assistance um, to me uh, and provide me with information. The, the pharmacy that I use right now actually are, they're great. And I don't necessarily have to go through um, the steps that I, I, have to go. I don't necessarily have to go through the steps of getting pre-authorization or worrying that they're not working on my pre-authorization. I know that oh. they, they will actually go ahead and do that and take the initiative to do that. And if they don't, then I then I yell and I, I <laughs> I've, I've completely been there. Um, but there is also something to be said about making building a relationship with your local pharmacist. I had one and then they demoted her. And she was the manager and she was the best. Yeah. And, yeah. And then next thing you know, they brought in the new lady and she's totally, she's totally Scarface. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? They'll give a call at the office and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this and we can see what we yes. can, um, what, what we can I, do for you. I, I, so we, we appreciate you. I'm going to interrupt this for, we'll, I'll take your question in one second, but um, there's somebody here whose ears should be burning because we've been talking about her. Kim, if you'll just stand up. This is Representative Kim Schofield. She champions our cause down at the uh, Georgia State Capitol. And she and I have been talking lately about trying to get a lupus caucus going locally. And we're just excited. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for all you do for people living with lupus. And your name has come up several times today when we've been talking mm -hmm. about just legislative work and just the work in the community and everything that we're doing. So thank you for being here, Representative Schofield. I, I just want to say for, for Representative Schofield, I think we have, um, we have built such a powerful advocacy community just with the work that you do, the work that I do, the work that Betty does for the foundation. And I want to thank you for that. Um, those of you who don't know, I, I left the practice of law and now work in health policy. Uh, one of the reasons why is because of Kim and and the strength that she's given me over time. But we have some, we have, in addition to the, the Lupus Caucus, I, I have plenty of ideas for work that we can do in the next legislative session. So definitely all of you will need your assistance working in the Georgia State Capitol next year. There we go. Thank you so much. And I see somebody had their hand up here with a question. I was diagnosed with lupus in 1995. In 2020, I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis. March 23, I'm in dialysis, fifth stage, in stage kidney failure. My question to the medical panel is that I need a, I need a transplant and I have younger family members who want to donate. I am very leery because I don't know if having a transplant, I don't want them to put their kidney to waste if lupus is going to still attack that kidney. And I'm struggling with that. And I just wanted to find out what medical advice, what are the statistics on survival, you know, at my age? And I need some peace before I can accept that transplant. And just wanted to hear your feedback on that. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, first of all, so sorry that you lost that war on diocese. Like I said, it drives everybody crazy. Um, so let, let me give you the the 50,000 foot answer to this. So Johns Hopkins has done this study. Uh, basically the question is, okay, if, if I donate to a family member, what happens to donors? So they have over 10 year follow-up data. And what they can tell you is if everything is done correctly, um, and this is all comers, then you have no change in mortality uh, no change or increased risk for end-stage renal disease, no increased risk for chronic kidney disease, apart from what you lose from the donation, a slight increased risk of uh, high blood pressure in those individuals. Now, so in lupus, well, what, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote. I had a guy that was, he was a triplet. He was a triplet. And he never would ask his brothers for the kidneys for the same kind of concerns you have. It's noble, but sometimes I think not necessary. In twin studies of lupus, identical twins, one lupus, one kid gets lupus, the other twin does not. Why is that? It's because what I was re referring to a little bit earlier called the first hit hypothesis. You have the genetic background, but for God knows whatever it is, that environmental trigger does not set them off. Does that mean that that could not happen into somebody in the future? It, it could, but you just simply can't predict it. Here's what the other thing I will tell you. Both Piedmont and Emory, and really globally in Western medicine, there is no finer, complete evaluation of the health of an individual than the donor physical exam. I mean, they cover, so half the time at both facilities, a person who's donating for a family member gets rejected because they'll find an alcohol cancer or something that was looked into because of the donor evaluation, but was otherwise undetected. So when done correctly, it is very, very good. Uh, well, Jim, have you ever had one fail? I have twice, 35 years. I've seen two people that donated and then had it come into them. One of them was the very first guy was a Caucasian guy. He was in his mid fifties. And he developed lupus nephritis, almost unheard of. And he had donated his kidney to his sister that had a completely different disease called FSGS. And then he developed lupus and, and then actually he lost his kidney, but he got a transplant himself. And I happen to know that Ike is still doing well. There is a family that I ran into in the last two years, all men. And they uh, carried a gene that we do not know what it is and it was transmitted down through the men. Those are examples because I want to be totally transparent with you. Um, I advocate for people to do this. Because um, you look, from, from where I'm sitting, you look pretty good. You look pretty healthy. And I think you'd probably do really great with a transplant. Uh, but, you know, that becomes an emotional decision. And, you know, there's just, there's no right answer to a emotional decision. But I hope that gives you a little background that way more than not, it is safe even in lupus family. Does that help? Maybe a little bit, maybe not. Yeah. Um, I agree with Dr. Tumlin. It's more rare uh, for the donor to develop lupus. I haven't had any situation like that. My colleague who is here, who is our director, Dr. Call, has had one case and she's been in practice for over what 15 15 years so yeah i think it, it there's a risk um right now we are i'm just going to maybe go to another direction with that in terms of is there any way to predict who will get lupus we we don't have those measures and that's had, I don't think so much the prediction, but as we understand lupus, there's a lot of research still going on about diagnosing lupus, but we don't have a way to predict, but I think it's a more of a lower likelihood. And I think it, he said it very well, it comes down to like really an emotional decision, but patients who've had transplants from their family members, we've had low, very few cases. Mm 
Okay. He misses dialysis. Like he misses, he says, because the constant going to dialysis is actually what makes him sicker. And so he'll come home vomiting, weak, you know, his bones were deteriorating. But because of the three days a week, he started maybe skipping one day out of the week. And it, it started messing with him because he'd go have a best friend, then show up to his best friends are dead. And him being born in 76, he's a little, a little bit older than me. So he, he's younger than most of the gentlemen in there. And so his kidney failed. And that was because Medicare would not pay for the medication to stop the uh, rejection. And there are some millionaire yet to write, and he would actually make a grant for the medication that came the day after he found out it failed. The medication showed up. And so he got a second one. The second one was fine. They left two of them hooked up. He was at 16%. So it's saying your chance even at 16% is good. You can, you can survive, but you will have problems. You know, and that, that's the thing you kind of want to because now it's metastasized to second one. Well, and, and they I, don't want to remove I it. I want to make that decision with a doctor. Yeah, so I was saying, people. so there's so many variables is more what I was trying to say. There, there's so many variables. It can metastasize, it can stay, yeah. and it can work. Yeah, and I think that's a decision, an educated decision to make between the patient and the, and the doctor. And, um, you know, somebody, somebody said... I, I just paired up two people with lupus to talk, a peer support. It's a young woman who was just diagnosed with lupus, and I put her with somebody older who's been living well with lupus, even though she's had a lot of complications. And she said, one thing that we know is th life happens, and not everything happens because of lupus. And who said that? Betty, you said it. I'm not dying today. And you might not, you know, I'm not dying today. So life happens. It's not always lupus. And it is just important to make sure that you're making educated decisions based on conversations with your doctors. And I, anecdotal data and stories are great, but we really need to, you really need to be talking to your doctor. Is that a fair? Yeah. I actually do share with my patients that the most common issues, medical issues in a patient with lupus is what's common in everybody else. So if you come, you know, if you call us and you're having a fever, the first thing we have to rule out is infection. Infection will kill you quick. Lupus can kill you, but not that quick. So I always uh, educate my patients. When you go to the ER with multiple symptoms, be very wary about us doctors telling you that it's all because of lupus, um, because th that's what's best for you. And I would say, uh, if you're in a support group, a lot of this you can talk through, you know, and feel better. Because oftentimes, like in our support group, uh, which has been going on now over 20 years, but we've had, um, I know when I joined, we had uh, folks there who had had lupus for almost 30 years. That excited me. Because what it said to me was, hey, maybe you're not going to die tomorrow. So when you're in a support group, you get to talk through a lot of issues. You can talk through things that you can't talk to in a group like this because you're concerned about what that person is going to say. But in your support group, you know, when you say, you know, and Kim always says when, um, Somebody asks you, how are you feeling? You say, oh, I'm doing fine. And she said, no, you're not. Because in the support group, you can honestly say, I feel like hell today. And we, we talk about, you know, especially for us, you know, we're um, doing housework and you get so fatigued, you can't do anything. And I say, leave that vacuum cleaner right there in the middle of the floor and see who moves it. Nobody but it'll be there the next day when you feel better. So you, you get to, you know, to express all of that 
in a support group and talk through, you know, this happened to me today. Has this ever happened to you? We don't give medical advice. All we do is tell you, this is what happened to me. We don't even recommend doctors. We'll say, this is my doctor and I am happy with that doctor. So we're not trying to substitute any medical advice. We're just telling you day to day, this is what happened to me. If I were there and you said, well, who's your rheumatologist? I'll tell you, it's Dr. Waltuck at Emory. I've had him over 20 years. Yes, I like him. You go to him, you may not like him. But I, I am very comfortable with him. And that's the other thing about a doctor. Lupus is, is long-term. So you really need to have a doctor that you can talk to just like I talk to Terry and Kim. If you can't do that, then that's going to be an issue because you need to walk in, you know, and be able to say, and I remember Dr. Tom mentioned Dr. Lieberman, who at one time was my rheumatologist, and he asked me a question. I said, well, you never asked me that before. You know, what is it? What should I be looking for that? And you really have to get that comfortable with your doctor and support groups can help you do that. They, they certainly can. Um, does, we're going to close this out here in a second. I think we, I'll take one last question uh, right up there. Okay, she's going to bring me. Oh, sorry. Hello. Um, so I have lupus and I've been diagnosed with dialysis. So my question is, what can I do other than, you know, get a kidney dialysis. I know you said that the um, my life expectancy is cut in half at this point. So what can I do since I'm already on dialysis and I have already been through all this process? Well, I feel like I owe you an apology for having said that. I, I do that too. Because sometimes, uh, I'll tell you why I say things like that. Sometimes young people, because we all think when we're 19, which a lot of young women I see, you think you're invincible. And I've had people make bad decisions that they didn't realize how bad something was. And sometimes I try to sort of shock them into realizing there's a real issue. So I'm sorry that you, your kidneys failed, first of all. Um, what can you do? Best thing, kiddo, is get a transplant. There is no single perturbation uh, where you will do better than with a transplant. And um, so just a quick word about this. There's some exciting things in transplant. Um, uh, UAB and uh, NYU Langone, uh, they're getting really close with what's called xenotransplantation. And that's from pig kidneys. And that's going to open a floodgate of uh, possible uh, transplants to people across the world. <coughs> and there's all kinds of issues with that yet still to come. Uh, but... Donation of kid cadaver transplants for people that have died from car accidents or whatever has been absolutely dead flat since 1980. <clears throat> the problem in the African American community, in particular, is that the donors oftentimes have other risk factors that preclude them from being a donor: high blood pressure, diabetes, certain kind of levels of weight issues uh, that preclude you from being a donor. So it's particularly acute in that, uh, that cohort. Uh, but again, I, everybody's trying to work around that, uh, but do whatever you can. And let me, one more quick thing for you. It's a numbers game, my dear. So every place, that, two seconds. In the UNOS organ system, there's Georgia, there's Tennessee, there's North Carolina, and there's Florida. They're all different. So if you, you can donate, in, uh, you can register in two places in each state. You could do Emory and, uh, or Piedmont, you can't even the same city, uh, MCG or maybe Macon, and then you can literally cross the border into Chattanooga and be on a different set of transplant donors in Chattanooga. You can do the same thing. You could drop down to Jacksonville, to Mayo. I have patients of mine that are listed in five different transplant programs. It's a numbers game. And the more kidneys that come in, eventually you're going to come. You can be on a plane and fly to Jacksonville in two hours. Doesn't matter. Yes, 
So that's a rude question, but I have an answer. Yes. So we actually have an outstanding um, rheumatologist, one of the leaders in lupus research, Dr. Michelle Petrie. She's at Johns Hopkins. So she did this study where she looked back at patients who stayed on hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil and those who came off. And that data revealed that patients who stayed on hydroxychloroquine had less flares and also less um, cases of complications. So as we know, over time, you can di get different complications from lupus. That comes from the flares. So right now, the recommendations are, unless you're really allergic to hydroxychloroquine, and that doesn't count fear, so that can be discussed, that you should stay on hydroxychloroquine, even if you're in remission, not having symptoms. Just to close out, I'll address just something that came up earlier. Someone had uh, alluded to... Um, if you have a risk or if, if your doctor has mentioned, maybe they're looking at your blood work, there's this autoantibody we measure called anti-C1Q that can maybe tell us that you may be at a higher risk for kidney lupus if there's anything you can do. The best thing you can do about uh, controlling any lupus complications, including kidney lupus, is to get your lupus treated and treated properly and as much as possible in remission or what we call low disease activity, meaning you're not having a lot of symptoms. So when we control your lupus overall well, you run le less of a risk of developing that complication. Um, class, Dr. Tumli talked about the, the different classes, one, two, three, four. One of the things he said, don't worry about one, don't worry about two. The only thing I would point out is these classes can switch. You can start off with one and two, and then five years later, 10 years later, you get another bout of kidney lupus and it's a three or four of four and five. So that's dangerous. So don't get lost. I tell my patients, your rheumatologist should be your favorite doctor. Not that we want to be your favorite anything, but really you, you should stay connected. The better you feel, keep in touch with your rheumatologist if they say every six months, once a year, but stay in touch. Stay when I say stay in touch, go, go and see your rheumatologist, go to your appointments. Um, kidney lupus doesn't hurt. You don't feel pain until it's too late. So you're not going to feel pain back here. Some people tell me I have pain here. Is it you, my, you know, do you have kidney lupus? You're not going to feel it. So I just go for your doctor's visits. So as Queen said, show up, pee in the cup, take your medications, go for your doctor's visits. Thank you all so much. We have a raffle to look forward to, so I'm gonna turn it over to Terry. We're gonna, I'm gonna be around if someone has questions, and this is gonna continue. This is not a one meeting. We're gonna continue with this program, so look out in your emails, social media, and tell other people about this. It's gonna be recorded, so you're gonna have this recording. Thank you so much. Okay, I wanna thank, thank the four of you for your um, presentations. If we, if anybody has additional questions, your my my business card is in your folder. Send them to me, and I'll make sure that you, I get answers for you. Okay. At this point, we are going to um, do a raffle. So I'm going to let Alondra pull the numbers. How many do we have? Oh, see this. This is why that I have this brilliant staff with me. There's an evaluation in your folders. Please take a look at the evaluation and fill it out. It's important to us for you to fill this out and we will, um, it helps us form our ideas for our upcoming program. So it's important to us. Fill it out and hand it to one of our staff members. And now we will, if you pull a number, I'll read it. Okay, well now we're gonna do, now we're gonna do the raffle. Okay, so it is 210844. 210844. 210864. We'll just keep them coming. 210854. There we go. There we go. Okay. Two one zero eight four eight. There you go. There you go. Two 
210850. 210850. 210879. Right up there. Okay. How many do we have left, y'all? Okay. You guys got to win these. 210853. There you go, Miss Betty. 210872. Up there. Okay. 210832. Okay, so what, we have two left? Two left? Okay. Two one zero eight two three. Two one zero eight four zero. Okay, and one more drum roll. There we go. Two one zero eight four seven. Two one zero eight four seven. Okay. Two one zero eight five one. There we go. Okay, I want to thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you for giving up your Friday and coming here to learn. I hope the program was useful. If you want to come up here, you can bring their, your evaluations to me right here. I'll be around for a little bit while the staff is packing everything up. But thank you for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you in future programs. Sign up for the Lupus Nephritis Support Group and sign up for our summit that is coming up. We'd love to see you all again. Thank you so much. Oh, and you know what? Somebody might be missing their parking. Check, make sure you've got your parking validation number because I've got one here. If anybody's missing it, I've got it up here, okay? <laughs>